Hi everyone, I'm Moose, and last time on Nerd, we explored the origins of slasher films from ancient history through the 1980s. And today, we're picking up right where we left off to see how slashers survived the 90s and beyond. How did Scream save the entire genre? Why didn't the movies it inspired have any staying power? And where do slashers go from here? This is the true story of slasher cinema. Part two, slashers reborn. When we last left our go-to genre, A Nightmare on Elm Street had just changed the game, but as budgets ballooned and audience fatigue began to set in, slashers saw a swift decline, and soon they were relegated to little more than scary VHS covers at the video store that your parents would never, ever let you rent. The box office of the early 90s was all about chasing that next blockbuster, the next Batman, the next Jurassic Park, the next City Slickers. City folk. And with their controversial gore and questionable morals, the big studios stayed far away from slashers. The genre needed a facelift, it needed a change for a new era, and above all else, it needed to be cool again. In 1996, one movie accomplished all three goals and single-handedly kicked off the revival. As we know, no individual film created the slasher genre. It was an amalgamation of nearly a century of cinema. But there's only one movie that deserves the credit for bringing it back to life. Scream. Created by screenwriter Kevin Williamson as a spec script called Scary Movie, the self-aware screenplay built a lot of buzz. What's your favorite scary movie? Uh, I don't know. And after a bidding war between studios, it wound up with Dimension Films and director Wes Craven. Now, as Andrew explained in our Franchise Killers video, Craven had already explored a similar metatextual theme with New Nightmare. But where his failed Freddy film fizzled, Scream soared, though it wasn't a sure thing. You want to play Psycho Killer? Can I be the helpless victim? Early reviews were mixed. Variety said that the underlying mawkish tone won't please diehard fans, and predicted modest commercial returns and fast theatrical playoff. Hindsight is 2020, but Scream really wasn't a smash hit out of the gate. When it premiered on December 22nd, 1996, it opened at number four, underneath Beavis and Butthead Do America, Jerry Maguire, and the live action 101 Dalmatians. <laughs> Positive word of mouth propelled it to profit, and after its initial run and a re-release, Scream raked in a well-deserved $170 million against a $14 million budget. Still the highest grossing slasher ever adjusted for inflation. Scream was smart, funny, and above all else, fresh, playing with the tired tropes of the genre while still delivering the scares and slaughter sought by slasher stands. In its wake, the floodgates flew open for a new wave of successful slasher cinema. Films like Urban Legend, Williamson's own I Know What You Did Last Summer, which he actually wrote before Scream, and of course, the Scream sequels. Now, where classic slashers portrayed their cast as cannon fodder, the new wave dressed the dead meat up with drama. They became fleshed out soap opera characters with dreams and desires and complicated pasts. Basically, Melrose Place by way of Elm Street. And where older movies mainly featured no-name or up-and-coming actors, shout out to Kevin Bacon, Jennifer Aniston, Crispin Glover, Johnny Depp, and Paul Rudd, 90 slashers had a lot more star power right out the gate, thanks to Drew Barrymore's shockingly brief appearance in Scream. Why do you want to know my name? I want to know who I'm looking at. What did you say? Scream set a new high bar for the genre, but almost as soon as it began, the postmodern era fell apart as we entered the lull. Hollywood wasted no time beating their hip new take on horror right into the ground, and soon we saw a shitload of Scream imitators with the same sardonic self-aware energy. Don't you guys get it? Come on, it's just like that urban legend. The same TRL-approved teens, and the same poster. Even the most iconic slashers tried to hop on the hot new bandwagon, to varying degrees of success. Halloween H2O did the best job of slapping a scream coat of paint onto an aging franchise, and then they completely blew all that goodwill with Resurrection two years later. You need to get the hell out of here! Go on, scoop! Skedaddle! Bride of Chucky leaned heavily into the weird meta aspect of it all, and Jason X was in space. 
don't worry, your favorite killers turned out to be just fine. Which brings us to another problem faced by the postmodern era. It failed to create new slasher stars. Besides Ghostface, what enduring new icons actually came from the 90s? Cupid, Hollow Man, The Fisherman, the unseen inevitability of death itself? I tried to capitalize, but I caught you. By focusing on the victims and making the killer's identity a mystery, it was hard for any one villain to make a lasting impression. When you see Jason, it's Jason Voorhees. When you see Michael Myers, it's Michael Myers. When you see Ghostface, it's Matthew Lillard, Skeet Ulrich, Laurie Metcalf, Timothy Oliphant, Scott Foley. You get the idea. Fatigue and a lack of fresh faces played a part in the downturn, but to me, the biggest culprit was Scary Movie. Stay with me. Released in 2000, the Wayans wacky slasher spoof hasn't exactly aged gracefully unless you just can't get enough of shitty bullet time parodies and American Pie jokes. But in its day, it was a massive, massive hit. It earned $280 million at the box office, $100 million more than Scream, and it spawned a huge new franchise of its own, which also all had the same fucking poster. Scream was a loving homage to the glory days of slasher cinema. It poked fun when the knives came out, shit still got extremely real. But the overt mockery and huge success of Scary Movie made it absolutely impossible to take straight up slashers seriously anymore. And soon they were replaced entirely by a very different flavor of fear. Scream's influence was fleeting, but like the vicious villains who gave the genre its name, slashers wouldn't stay dead for long. So let's finish up with a look at the rebirth. Now horror didn't go away entirely after the brief scream boom fizzled out, it just moved on to the next big thing, which in this case came from Japan. J-horror developed independently of the slasher craze, taking inspiration from Japanese folklore and its unique take on ghosts known as yure. They portrayed a slower, more psychological kind of terror, still violent, but it wasn't blood and guts putting butts in the seats. In 2002, Gore Verbinski remade director Hideo Nakata's breakthrough hit Ringu as The Ring, arguably a better film than its Asian counterpart and certainly more profitable. In response, Hollywood immediately greenlit westernized remakes of The Grudge and Dark Water, and for a while, our country lived in utter terror of ghostly girls dressed in white with long black hair covering their faces. But as the J-horror fad faded, another even more powerful force gripped our consciousness. Nostalgia. It's fairly well documented that the nostalgia cycle operates on a delay of about 20 to 30 years. In the 70s, we became obsessed with the greasers and car culture of the 50s and 60s. In the 90s, the bell bottoms and bright colors of the 70s made a big comeback. And as a new millennium dawned, our collective consciousness traveled back to the 1980s. Birthplace of big hair, leg warmers, yours truly, and of course, the golden age of slasher movies. And what better way to capitalize on our fixation with this bygone age than a shameless stream of remakes. 2003 was a big year for slasher staples. Not only did it see the long-awaited Freddy vs. Jason crossover, to this day still the highest grossing entry in either series, it also introduced us to our first slasher reboot, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> The slick Michael Bay production lost a little bit of that grimy snuff film aesthetic of the original classic, but it didn't skimp on the scares or the slaughter, and its success not only paved the way for the revitalization of ultra-violent grindhouse flicks like The Devil's Rejects and try-hard torture porn like Hostel and Saw, it also opened up the floodgates for a stream of absolutely shameless remakes. Between 2003 and 2010, we saw new versions of cult classics like Prom Night, Last House on the Left, my Bloody Valentine, Black Christmas, not to mention the big boys like Friday the 13th, A Nightmare on Elm Street, and of course, Rob Zombie's Halloween and Rob Zombie's Halloween 2. 
Now, most of these films were financially successful, though again, no single slasher was able to grip our collective consciousness. But that's just kind of how society works today. There's no single monoculture anymore. The internet has made it so everyone can find their specific niche and seek out content that appeals to them specifically. The days of Jason Voorhees dropping in on Arsenio Hall are long gone, but horror is actually healthier than ever. In theaters, Blumhouse has honed it to a hugely successful formula, churning out a diverse slate of scary movies about everything from found footage to full-on societal collapse. Simultaneously, Jordan Peele is injecting a vital dose of cultural criticism and fresh perspective with smash horror hits like Get Out and Us. And while they're far from traditional slasher films, that doesn't mean the genre's gone away either. If you think I'm gonna settle for just another sleazeball video promotion, you must be dreamer. Going straight to video was the death knell for slashers in the 80s, but the rise of streaming and prestige TV has made it a much less sleazy pursuit. And series like Scream, Scream Queens, The Purge TV Show, and especially American Horror Story 1984 have really leaned into the aesthetic and created the next generation of savvy self-aware slashers. Of course, they're still killing it in theaters as well. Happy Halloween, Michael. <laughs> Just last year, 40 years after the first film revolutionized the face of horror, a reboot of Halloween returned the franchise to its former glory, shattering records and setting us up for two more sequels. A new child's play took Chucky in a different but still decent direction, and with reboots of Candyman, Black Christmas, and Friday the 13th incoming, the genre shows no signs of slowing down. From the theater to our TVs, from Giallo to Ghostface, slashers have endured throughout decades of evolving mediums and morals. And while they may never be as big as they once were, slashers are here to stay. Thanks for watching, everyone. What is your favorite post scream slasher? Do you love Valentine? Are you obsessed with Urban Legend? Do you still know what we did last summer? Leave a comment, let us know. Make sure to participate in Create a Killer 2019. Time is running out. And as always, please subscribe to Now This Nerd.